Hello, and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast number 2083. The topic is Q&A, and the title is Strength vs. Growth, the Impact of Peak Contraction Hold Length. What in the world <laughs> does any of that mean? Uh, there was a fun moment in Meredith and I training recently, so I'm training Meredith for a contest. If you didn't know that, uh, please check out some of our contest prep uh, podcasts. We share a lot about the process of contest prep and the mindset and fun thoughts uh, that go into that process. We also include details of our nutrition and training and other interesting aspects that if you're ever considering competing for a competition or if you have before, it might just be fun to relate to it, but it's pretty good information, I think. (laughs) So Meredith and I were training recently and we were doing some dead leg crunches and these are a very weird variation of a crunch, but what they do is they help to build the upper four ab muscles and pull in the lower abdomen. So if somebody feels like their lower abdomen kind of sticks out, first of all, you gotta make sure you're correcting hip tilt and make sure all that is correct. And then from there, you can actually train the lower abdomen and strengthen it in in a way in which it will allow that muscle to, um, try to think how to like word this like physiologically correctly, uh, the, the tone, the tension within the muscle, uh, uh, increases as you would strengthen it and that creates a tighter appearance in the muscle. This is similar to people with diastasis recti where they have weakness in their abdominal muscles and it causes a stomach distension. Uh, I've helped people uh, you know, post-pregnancy for females and also males have diastasis recti issues as well if they've been overweight or had other injuries. Uh, but we will correct that And what it does is it pulls in, it tightens in uh, the abdominal wall. So we're just using similar concepts uh, for aesthetic clients. And Meredith is an example of that. So a dead leg crunch is a wonderful, wonderful exercise. But it requires a couple nuances in order to perform it correctly. One of the nuances is you reach up to the ceiling to create the crunch rather than curling your shoulders towards your feet. That is a ridiculously significant like make or break detail. And at the top of the movement, when you're reaching up for the ceiling, you actually want to, eventually you can hold like dumbbells or weight plates to make it harder uh, weighted wise, but you have to hold that contraction at the top. The reason why it's necessary to hold that contraction is you have to hold it long enough that it forces the lower abdomen to contract for stability. What this means is you you want to have a nice strong contraction, get that full engagement of the lower abs, and then you would come out of that repetition and go into the next. So I asked her, I said, hey, at the top, do a two count hold. So she gets to the top, we go one, two, and then she comes down. She did a couple reps and then she asked, why are we doing a two count? And believe it or not, that unleashed everything that I'm going to talk about in today's podcast is it was actually a really fun question. I find this stuff ridiculously fun. I do not believe that most people do, which is why I don't spend a lot of podcasts on this, (laughs) on these kind of details. But every once in a while I get fired up and I feel like doing it. Uh, So who knows? Uh, We're just going to do this one for me maybe. (laughs) But the funness to that question was number one. If you want somebody to to pause for a one count, for a full controlled contraction, you have to ask them for a two count. (laughs) The reason why is people will say one before they fully stopped, or they'll say one like as they're releasing. Everybody's like one is a half ass one. (laughs) So it's universal. Uh, I mean, I can name on one hand probably the people that would extend their pauses just out of like sheer discipline to not mess it up. They're like, screw to one count, I'm gonna do a longer count just to make sure that I don't miss that contraction. And no matter how tired I get, no matter how heavy this gets, I will never miss that component. Count on like one hand. So 
almost everyone, will break down and not get a full one count. So if you ask them for a two count, you're at least going to get a one count. <laughs> the second reason, and this is what today's podcast is really going to be about, is for Meredith, we wanted growth as the main goal. She wants to see the bumps in her abs. So we want growth as the main goal. We're going to get some secondary strength development for sure. But strength wasn't our focus. A sustained held contraction. When you're contracting a muscle against weight load, but it's not moving, is an isometric contraction. You can do isometric contractions at full contractions. You can do them at partial length of contractions. Uh, so you think of a bicep curl, instead of curling to the top and holding it, curl it halfway and hold it. That's an isometric hold. Anytime you're contracting the muscle, but it's not moving under that contractional force, it's called an isometric. An isometric contraction produces a strength-based response. So the muscles and your neurological connection from the brain to the muscles gets stronger against resistance in that exact position that you're holding the isometric at. And studies have shown, and there's a little bit of debate, blah, 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 plus or minus 10% of flexion and extension. So if I hold my elbow at 90 degrees and I do really hard, aggressive isometrics, I'm going to strengthen that particular position against resistance plus or minus 10 degrees. So from from 80 to 100 degrees, my ability to resist against weight load would increase. So an isometric contraction produces a strength-based response. An isometric contraction produces very minimal muscle damage. It does produce muscle damage, yes, but in comparison to weighted eccentrics, I'm going to explain what that is in a second. Uh, essentially, it's, it's basically when the muscle is extending under weight load. So there, that literally was a second. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't plan on explaining it that fast. But that's essentially what an eccentric hold is, uh, an eccentric phase of a movement. Um, when we do a bicep curl, I'm just going to keep that example. When I curl the weight from the bottom up to the top, the moving phase, the movement phase, is called a concentric. That's the contraction. I would then, at the peak contraction, have all the muscle fibers bunched up, flexed as tight as they could. And then, when I extend that muscle and I lower the weight back down to the bottom under weight load, that's called the eccentric portion. So I I simplify this a little bit and say, okay, the contraction is the concentric, the extension is the eccentric. So C and C, E and E, a little bit of alliteration there to make it easier to remember. But the eccentric phase, when you're extending a muscle under weight load, creates an enormous amount of muscle damage. So an isometric contraction in comparison to an eccentric phase of a contraction produces less damage. So an isometric contraction creates more so a strength response. Whereas, if you move under weight load, you get a weighted concentric and a weighted eccentric, you will create more muscle damage. You do not get as intense of a contractile strength stimulus, so you don't get as much strength as a response. So instead, you're making a trade for more muscle damage, thus creating more muscle growth possibility. So your nutrition, your sleep, and all the other stuff have to support that process. So the ideal duration for optimal stimulus is actually similar and in some ways competitive between an isometric hold and a weighted concentric eccentric. What's interesting about this is that isometric holds can be held for maximum effectiveness, usually between 10 to 30 seconds. There are definitely going to be some outliers. People might hold it for a little bit less. People might hold it for longer. But generally, that is going to be a very common kind of the bulk of the time, the majority of the time, isometric holds are for 10 to 30 seconds. That's going to produce the best strength response. And again, 
most of the time. You're definitely going to find outliers. In weighted movement, weighted concentrics and eccentrics, the typical maximal effective time under tension for growth is 20 to 40 seconds. Absolutely, you can produce growth between 10 to 20 seconds, even less, uh, if you have enough volume in your training. You absolutely can produce growth with enough, like if you're like 40 to 60 seconds, so on the other end of the spectrum. But you have to have enough volume in your training. Typically, you would have to do more volume to create the, the exact muscle damage and growth response if you go under 20 seconds and or if you go over 40 seconds. So they're possible, but the kind of like sweet spots, the best spots uh, for isometrics is going to be 10 to 30 seconds. Weighted movement is 20 to 40 seconds. What this means is for an isometric hold, you're going to do one repetition, one hold for 10 to 30 seconds. Sometimes people will do, you know, a five count hold, get out of position, get back into position, five count hold, out of position, into position, five count hold. Sure, you're going to see variations like that. Weighted movements, you're typically going to see, you know, a two to three second contraction, maybe a one count hold in the a full contraction position, then a two to three count, maybe even a four count eccentric. And then there's maybe a very slight, if any, pause in the full extension and then right back up. So it's kind of like you're going to curl a dumbbell, curl up one, two, hold, one, down, one, two, three, pause, next. So each rep might take, in, in, in the actuality, maybe five seconds. So what's interesting about this and what made me excited when Meredith asked that question was Meredith's crunches. We know that her time under tension for this movement, she, we want it to be you know, light enough that she can do it for at least 10 seconds. If she's doing something so heavy, she can only do maybe two reps in, in like six seconds. That We're not like training her dead leg crunch for like a one rep max. <laughs> so that's not going to be optimal. Likewise, if she were to do dead leg crunches trying to build her abdominal muscles, for longer than, say, 60 seconds, it's too light of a weight load. It's not really going to produce a maximal growth response. So the best response time, whether you're training for strength or growth, is going to be somewhere between 10 to 40 seconds. So for Meredith, we knew that we had a 10 to 40 second range to maximize our growth stimulus. Since we wanted a growth response, we want to optimize the number of concentric and eccentric phases during that time because it's during the concentric and eccentric phases that she creates muscle damage. So if we held the top of the movement for too long, we would increase the isometric stimulus, the strength response but we would lessen the number of concentric and eccentric phases. So you would lessen their stimulus and thus you would lose some of the growth benefits. But if we didn't hold the contraction at all, then we risk not fully engaging the lower abdomen. Again, the lower abdomen requires a maximal reach, absolute 100% maximal effort reach, and a slight pause which fires a necessary stabilization response in the lower abs, which is what causes them to pull inward and, and, and tighten over time. So we wanted some of a hold to fully engage and involve the lower abs, but we didn't want too long of a hold in that it would reduce the number of concentric and eccentric phases. Now what's interesting about this is I find that very fun. <laughs> now, these are just incredibly just, I mean, you could, you could easily say, who gives a shit? <laughs> Absolutely easily. And just be like, just do 10 really hard reps, call it a day, and you're going to get a response. You're going to get, you know, maybe not fully 100% growth. You're going to get some strength. You're going to get some response. 
And if you continue to try to increase that weight load in that, you know, just 10 repetitions, you're going to get a continued progression and response. Maybe all of a sudden you can't do it for 10, so now you range from 8 to 12 reps. Once you can do a weight for 12, you increase weight, but now you can only do it for 8 next time. Then you get it for 9, then you get it for 10. So eventually you can increase weight load and repetitions, and if you're somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 40 seconds, you're going to make improvement. But... That's not the type of trainer I am. That's not the type of work that I like to put in. (laughs) If I'm going to spend time training, I want the best possible stimulus, the best possible outcome for my time, my money, and my energy invested. I want the stupidest, slightest, littlest detail ever to be in my favor. If I can control it, I'm damn sure going to control it because... Even if something produces just a 0.1% increase in workout quality. So in your entire workout, if you can increase the outcome by 0.1% and you train on average four times per week, you typically don't really take a significant amount of time off. Maybe you take a week off for a vacation here, a week off for vacation there. You get sick a little bit. So maybe you only end up, end up training the equivalent of 48 weeks a year. So you take a month off. And for a lot of the clients and myself, that doesn't even happen. <laughs> so we'll actually train more than that. But you would average in a single year a 19.2% increase in outcome. So 0.1% per workout times four workouts per week is 0.4 times 48 weeks per year is 19.2% increase. You could be, you know, very close to in a reasonable rounding 20% better by the end of the year by just doing something that made you 0.1% better per workout. Now, if you work out like for me, I've been working out since I was 15 years old. I'm 40. That's 25 years. Even in just 10 years of time, in 10 years of working out, that 0.1% better per workout equates to 192% better outcome. You can 2x, you can two times the possible progress made in 10 years. So you can make twice as much progress in 10 years by simply increasing your workout quality by 0.1%. That is huge. That is exciting. That is firing up like that. Man, that makes me want to crush every single rep. I am going to work out for the next 10 years. And the thought that in the next 10 years, I can get twice the outcome? Oh, why would I not do whatever the stupidest littlest thing was, right? Why would I not search for every little nuance I could find? And I do that in training, I do that in nutrition, I do that with supplements, I do that with my rest. I've listened to like 7,000 sleep podcasts because I want to get better sleep. Why would you not do this? Oh, I, can't, like, I can't fathom missing these moments, missing these opportunities. They might seem like little things, but the little things are the big things. If you want to know what separates average from extraordinary, it's these stupid little 0.1% things. It's the little things added up, added up, added up, added up. That makes the big differences that you see between people. I know this. I've worked with thousands and thousands of people. I've been working with people for 14 years. Oh, no, no, longer than that, 24 years. I've been working with people for 24 years, taught the university level, taught exercise physiology, all the sciencey stuff. I have a bunch of certifications. I've worked with thousands of clients, taught 500 plus students. I have seen it, I have seen it, I have seen it, that what separates the great people from the people who want to be great are these stupid little 0.1% things. That's it. It's not, you know... They were so lucky they had a million dollars and they never had to worry about money. They were so lucky their genetics were so superior they never had to work that hard. It's none of that bullshit. It's none of those excuses. It's little 0.1% things done. Day after day after day after day after week after week after month after month after year after year after decade after decade. It's these 0.1%. 
So I would encourage you to look for those, to find those, to maximize those. So I thought this was fun to share. I hope it fires you up. It fired me up. <laughs> uh, but get into the training components. If you're wanting more strength, consider using longer isometric holds at the peak contraction of your movements. That will produce more strength. If you want more growth, you want to control the peak contraction, but don't spend too much time there. You want to maximize your concentric and eccentric phases. Awesome. Thought it was fun. I love this stuff. If you are also interested in these weird little nuancey things, let me know and I'll make these podcasts more often. I find them really fun, so I'd like to make them more often, but I don't want to like alienate everyone and everyone think I'm completely crazy. <laughs> At least not for this reason. Uh, but if you like it, let me know. I, I love this stuff and I think it's super fun. If you have any questions, you can always reach out on the website, www.brutalirongym.com. You can send me a message. If you scroll to the bottom of the homepage, there's a contact form. You can contact me anytime, and I will send you a message back within two weeks. If you like the podcast, please consider sharing the podcast. The more people we share it with, the more people we can help. If you share it on social media, that does reach the most amount of people. So if you're going to share it, that'd be a great way to do it. You can also just share it word of mouth in a conversation with friends. Anytime somebody asks you about training or nutrition, just think of throwing out this podcast to them and encouraging them to give it a listen. If you like the podcast, please consider donating through support the podcast, which you can do on our website. And if you like the information we share in the podcast, so you can find more from us on our social media channels. I share different and weird, fun things separate from what we cover in a podcast on our social media channels. So if you don't yet, please go follow us on Instagram and YouTube so you can see that content as well. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.